It's time to talk about fruit and the six ways you can introduce it in your mead making process. So let's get started. So in this video, I wanna spend some time talking about the six ways you can introduce fruit and mead and the best times to maybe add them in your mead making process. I'm now uh, about to jump the hill of 400 brews underneath my belt. And so I feel confident to give some expertise on this. So let's talk about the six ways you can introduce them. There are, well, I'll just run down them. So number one, you can use fresh fruit. Two, you can use frozen fruit. Three, you can use concentrates or like wine bases. And I'll um, talk about why I've lumped them together. Number four are juices. So apple juice, grape juice, etc. Five are purees, which I have some examples of those in a second. And six are flavorings, which is, again, another way to get the flavor of the fruit you want. All of these are accessible to you in some form or fashion. The great thing about the internet is pretty much all of these are accessible to you in some form or fashion. The exclusive ones are fresh fruit, frozen fruit sometimes, but everything else, uh, and juices, everything else is generally something you can buy online. I live in Oklahoma and we have access to some fruits, but for the most part, we're a little bit dry in like the very interesting ones. So every once in a while, I'll find a good deal on something interesting like dragon fruit and I'll snatch it up while I can. But if there's something rare, like a boysenberry, or a um, marionberry. Those are like weird fruits that don't grow anywhere near me. I'm not getting access to those without spending some uh, significant money to say the least. So let's talk pros cons of each one. Let's go with our fresh fruit first. Pros, if you have it local to you, it's probably gonna be cheaper, which is nice. It is also going to be the most uh, controllable because you can pick literally pick the fruit and say I want this one I want this one and I'm gonna get all of the best fruits out of that source which is really nice the con is fresh fruits not always available to you it's not available to me when I want to make a Marion berry mead I'm not able to do that with fresh fruit I've got to really outsource it so that's kind of a pro con there frozen fruit now these might be a little more accessible depending on where you're at. Again, my dragon fruit example, um, I don't even know where dragon fruit grows, but I do know that I could get it in a frozen form. So that's a, a pro there. You might have greater access to it. Cons, you can't necessarily control the quality that's happening there. You're gonna get, let's say for example, you want blueberries and you buy four pounds of frozen blueberries you're gonna get exactly what you get. You might get tart ones, you might get sweet, a mixture. You don't really know what you get until you open that bag up and go for it. Concentrates and wine bases. So there are a bunch of different kinds of wine bases out there of literally every single fruit I think you can find. And they are often, I don't wanna say cut with, but they often have other sugars in there that are attributing to the, the sugar content of the, the overall wine base. So you might not get like a, a pear wine base, might have some apple sugars in there, some concentrates in there that are not quite the thing that you want. But they are accessible and I quite like them. I actually have an example right here. So this is a mango mead made with a wine base and I sent it to a comp a year and, ago, a year and a half ago, I think, and it was like, third place, I think, out of the, the stone fruit category. So obviously the wine bases can do decently well. I've paired them with the concentrates. You might also in your frozen food section find the concentrate side, meaning that you can find concentrated apple juice, orange juice, cherry juice, whatever you have in that frozen concentrate. I use those all the time. In fact, my apple juice or apple mead I make often has some of that apple juice concentrate put into it because it's just cheap and easy. So why not use stuff like that? So pros, accessibility, cons, that the, the wine base side can have the con of it not always being as true. This doesn't taste like a fresh mango. It tastes kind of like a cooked mango. So that's an alternative issue, but it still can work. So let's talk about juices now. I've had examples up here. This is a fresh fruit 
mead that I made. This was my peach pie mead. It started with a ton of fresh peaches. That's why I have it right here. This is a no water blueberry mead. This is another example of a fruited mead. And it's also an example of maybe juice as well. So we'll talk about it in a second, but this used all frozen blueberries, which is why I'm, I put it right here. So it's all frozen blueberries, no water. Interesting. The concentrate slash wine base. Here's my Welch's pie mint. So I literally bought Welch's grape juice, put some honey with it and made some mead. You can definitely do this. You can take and use any fruit juice out there. There are lots of options. In fact, if you go to most like Whole Foods stores or natural grocers, stuff like that, they might have some more interesting uh, fruit juices for you to try. What's important here is you wanna find stuff without the potassium metabisulfite or potassium sorbate or any of these other names you see on screen. These things are all preservatives that often will kill off yeast, inhibit them from actually fermenting. You don't wanna deal with that. So watch out for these things on those labels. Also watch out that they're not cut with other sugars, other juices. Sometimes these juices are part this, part that, and uh, it's kind of cheapens the whole taste of it, to be honest. So pros, very accessible. Cons, they can have the, uh, generally speaking, they can have some flaws if they're not true, if they're not 100% juice or something like that. Purees, I've got some examples of purees here. So this, these are new companies, or not new, but new products out there. This is from Boyron. This is a puree, a strawberry puree in a carton. And uh, this is the same thing as using real fruit. These are aseptic, meaning that they, uh, if I remember correctly, that means essentially that it can stay in this for a long amount of time without having to deal with any fermentation or yeast or something like that, you know, causing issues. Another example is Oregon fruit puree. This is a passion fruit. This is a new thing they do. They have cans that they've done previously, but they now have these baggies and it's got a spout. I actually used half of this earlier. It's also aseptic, so it's not going to um, end up re-fermenting or anything. I used half of this bag. I saved the other half for a different time. So this is a pro of specifically Oregon uh, fruit purees is the baggy side. These are really good. I have a peach mead. I've got a passion fruit mead that I've done with them and they taste so good. Mm. I, I really am a big fan and they're not too expensive. That baggie from my local homebrew store was about 22 or 23 bucks, which is expensive, let's be real. But for three pounds of passion fruit, I'm not gonna get a better deal than that, to be honest with you. I, I think this is probably the best deal I'll get for passion fruit. Something basic like a blueberry, I'm probably gonna get a better bang for my buck if I go buy frozen or juice or something like that. Pros of purees, you can get interesting fruits because the fru fruit puree coming from Oregon, uh, fruit, fruit, I can't say it, fruit puree or boyrin, uh, they have some really cool stuff that you might not get local to you. Con, it's a puree. When you put it into the meat, it cloudies it up quite a bit. And generally speaking, it makes it harder to clear up unless you get off of the fruit itself. So it's a catch 22. I've had pretty good success in mixing it in really well, letting it set for a couple days, letting it all settle at the bottom and then racking off of that. It generally will get a good amount of flavor. But if you want the real true flavor experience, leave it in there and bottle it and you'll have some sediment for sure, but you'll get the most fruit flavor out of the brew. Last but not least, we have our flavorings. Now, I have an example here. This is a lemon, excuse me, white peach lemonade mead that came from a wine kit. So the wine kit itself was like a, a whatever grape base, super basic grape base, with this white peach lemonade flavoring. Came in this baggie, kind of looked like pea, to be honest. It's kind of weird. It was the flavoring itself. Not the real thing. It's kind of like a syrup. It works. This tastes like white peach lemonade. It does have a little bit of a fake sugar flavor. It doesn't always, it's not, it is not easy to fake out with somebody. Uh, I think they're very, ob like, it's very obviously not the real thing. I'm sure they make some higher quality syrups. I know there's lots of companies. There's Amaretti, there's uh, the wine based company I used. Uh, there's a whole slew of other syrup, not syrup of flavorings that you can get. 
And for some purposes, those flavorings are very helpful. I don't know that I would use them for fruit. If I wanted to make a fruit and mead, I'm probably not gonna go buy a blueberry syrup from Amaretti at my level. Now, I know they make higher level stuff, stuff that can be often used in uh, breweries and things like that, and they get away with great flavors out of those, but I personally don't like using them at my homebrew level for my fruited meads. Now they have some interesting stuff, <laughs> vanilla bean, marshmallow, stuff like that that's a little harder to get for a flavor, go for it. But I stay away from it, generally speaking. Pros of those, you get a lot of flavor options. Cons, they taste 75% of the way there, of the flavor. But there's still something missing. So let's talk about when to add the fruit because that also makes a difference. Step one is as you design your recipe, you want to take a step back and say, okay, I'm making a mango mead, for example. Let's think about the yeast first. What kind of yeast is gonna best complement my mango? For me, I would immediately turn to Lauvin QA23 or Lauvin K1B1116. Both are great at highlighting tropical fruited fruits. So I would turn to those and say, I'm gonna get this yeast to go with my fruit. Now, obviously that's exclusive to mangoes. There's hundreds of fruits out there and you have to kind of figure out what yeast will pair best with that. Um, I have a link to a video you can find with some information about that, but there's no comprehensive list of everywhere, like of every single fruit and yeast pairing. You kind of have to do some research. So step one, how am I going to pair my yeast with my fruit? From there, you can decide how am I gonna get the best flavor extraction out of the fruit. Let's say I'm using fresh fruit. I like to put my fresh fruit, if I can, in the primary and the secondary. If I only have one option, I've recently done it more in the primary and had better results because it allows for my yeast choice and the fruit to play together and work on the same flavor profile. Now it does cause some issues with racking and stuff like that, but it's my opinion, the best place to put it in primary and secondary. Secondary fermentation is like, after fermentation's mostly occurred, it's the lesser vigorous fermentation. Primary is where it's, that thing's full steam ahead, chewing through the sugars and the yeast are happy and healthy and they just wanna go crazy. You can lose some of the aromatics of fruit therefore losing some of the flavors of the fruit. The sugars get consumed, of course. So that's kind of the primary state. The secondary stage is when that fermentation is less vigorous. You'll still probably have some fermentation on it unless you stabilize or pasteurize, which we'll talk about in a second. But you'll have some fermentation in secondary fermentation, but it will lose less of the flavor profile. I just mentioned stabilizing, uh, pasteurizing. If you do either one of those things before you add your fruit, you will essentially guarantee that the um, yeast will not consume any more sugar. So the fruit will be safe to add the sugar coming from it to the brew, therefore adding the flavor in the most uh, true way, I guess. This can work well. As long as your brew is higher ABV, if it's a low ABV brew and there's a wild yeast on said uh, fruit, there's a chance that those wild yeast might be beefy enough to kickstart fermentation again. So just be wary of that if, if you're doing that. These are all case by case, so I'll quickly run down this fresh fruit, primary and secondary. Best places to put it if you can do both. Primary is my favorite to do if I only have one option. Frozen fruit. Same idea, primary or secondary, or primary if you just have one option. The uh, wine base, this is gonna be in primary because it's gotta have fermentation on it and it's gonna get the best result there. So that's, that's the wine base. So concentrates is the other side of that and concentrates can be added either or, beginning or end. But I like to add my concentrates most of the time at the end when the sugar presence will stay within the brew. So I'll stabilize or pasteurize and then add my fruit in my fruit uh, concentrate, like my apple juice. When I make my apple meads, I'll add that apple juice concentrate post stabilizing to get as much sugar content from the apples as I can. 
juices, you're going to want to add your juices generally in primary. Um, I have very rarely seen people do it in secondary, but you can. Uh, I would not, I would say just be, be careful you don't have any wild yeast that kick up. Purees can be added either or primary or secondary. Uh, if you want to make, let's say you're making a like traditional mead and you want to add some fruit puree, it's hard to say, you can add it at any point, but I would say to add it later, kind of end of secondary, allow some extra fermentation to occur. You'll get more of that fruit flavor in the mead without blowing out as much of the flavor profile. And finally, flavorings. Uh, you could do them in the primary, but I think a lot of people add the flavorings after stabilizing or after primary fermentations occurred. That's because you'll lose less of the flavor there. There are lots of ways to do this. Fruit sourcing is super important. Get high quality fruit. Just try things. Look at your local grocery store. Look at, if you have a, something like a chef store or like big box store that has lots of options, go in there, check out the frozen fruit section. You might be surprised what they have. Check out juice sections. You know, the options are limitless and I highly encourage you to try this yourself. Try to do some research. Let me know what you think below, and I'd be very curious to hear what you think about this, how you introduce fruit. This is just how I've done it and my expertise, and my time spent, I think it's been pretty good, and I've got many examples on how to do this. Thank you for watching. I hope to see you in a future video. I'll see you then. Cheers.